officially welcome everyone to, to this new session of the Indiana Lead Summer Tax Workshop Series. I'm Dr. Leopoldo Parada. I'm a lecturer in tax law at the University of Leeds uh, here in the UK. And I'm together co-hosting this series with my colleague and friend, uh, Leandro Ledman, who is now going to present herself and our speaker of today. So Leandro, over to you. Thanks so much, Leopoldo. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Zach Lisko. Zachary Lisko is an associate professor of law at Yale Law School. His main research interest is understanding the appropriate policy levers to address income inequality, and in particular, the role that tax policy versus other legal rules should play. He also works in a variety of other areas, including urban economics, environmental policy, and empirical legal studies. Lisko earned his PhD in economics from the University of California, Berkeley, and his JD from Yale Law School. He graduated summa cum laude from Harvard College with degrees in economics and environmental science and public policy. He has been a staff economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors and worked for the World Bank's Inspector General. Liskow clerked for the Honorable Stephen F. Williams on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. And the paper that he is presenting today is the psychology of taxing capital income evidence from a survey experiment on the realization rule. And that's co-authored with Edward Fox from Michigan, who I understand is in the audience today and is welcome to, to jump in at any point in uh, response to questions, et cetera. So with that, let me turn it over uh, to Zach to take it away. Great, so thanks so much for coming today. It's great to see all of you in a sense. Uh, and thanks so much to Leandra and Leopoldo for organizing all this. I will just go ahead and share my slides. All right, uh, so thanks for coming. Uh, so this paper is like ultimately on, you know, how can we tax uh, capital income? And uh, let me begin with an example here. So in 2015, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook stock went up by $11 billion. He sold no shares uh, and he paid almost no tax. So I don't know about most of you, but my income in 2015 was mostly from my wages. I paid tax on that. Uh, and Zuck, and as we now know from ProPublica, if we didn't already know it, uh, Zuck along with the, our 25 richest people uh, pay almost nothing. The reason for this, of course, we all know uh, in this audience is, is the realization rule, that assets must be sold or otherwise disposed of, at least typically, uh, for tax to be imposed. So the realization rule creates a lot of problems. It is inequitable. Estimates suggest that about $2 trillion per decade go uncollected in tax revenue, overwhelmingly among the rich. It's inefficient. Uh, because there are incentives to sell assets, or sorry, to not sell assets, or to invest in certain types of assets uh, that you know, will be taxed annually. And it's complicated. You need to have all these laws to address taxpayer gaming as they try to realize losses and avoid realizing gains. So this is part of the reason that uh, Ron Wyden, the Senate Finance Committee Chair, has what is, I think, fairly characterized as a long shot plan uh, to, to, to address this. Uh, so there are all these problems, like why would we tax capital this way? So for harder to value assets, it's easier to explain. For a piece of art, it's hard to know exactly what it's worth each year. Uh, it would also be hard to sell a piece of your piece of, uh, of your art to, uh, to pay your taxes uh, if you couldn't take out a loan. Uh, but for easy to value liquid assets like publicly traded stocks and bonds, the realization rule is, at least to many of us, really something uh, of a puzzle. Uh, a leading explanation, though, is that there's a public aversion to taxing paper gains, uh, the unrealized appreciation in the value of, of assets. But we have no empirical evidence uh, on whether such attitudes are prevalent or why they're held, or, or why those views are held. So what this paper does, it uses uh, survey experiments to understand the psychology of the realization rule and gain insight into this crucial aspect of taxing capital income. So this survey uh, is following uh, others in economics, uh, especially as Steve Shefferin, I should point out, 
Uh, this helps us learn about features uh, that do not reveal themselves in markets. This especially might matter where elite attitudes, like those that uh, those of us hold, uh, differ from those of the general population. Uh, so what we do is we recruit a large demographically representative set of respondents who answer just answer questions about their views regarding taxing uh, gains in stock value before those stocks are sold. We focus on publicly traded stocks because they lack the issues of valuation and liquidity that other assets have. They're also a large share of US wealth. Uh, to help understand people's attitudes further, we have randomized persuasion interventions and also a large number of policy variants that we ask people about. We have three main findings. First, respondents strongly oppose taxing unsold stock gains. 75% uh, oppose, only 25% support. There's a flip side though, which is that there's surprisingly strong support for taxing at sale, uh, including housing, or transfer, including at death, in places where current law often does not tax gains in the US. Uh, we all have uh, these randomized persuasion treatments that yield pretty interesting results. Uh, when respondents are given more information via videos about both the pros and the cons of taxing unsold gains, or alternatively about uh, told that whatever the taxes that's imposed is only going to apply to very rich people, there's relatively little change in preferences, uh, which we said which we think says something about the, the durability and strength of these attitudes. We also, uh, I'll discuss this uh, in a little more detail at the end, there, we look into why people hold these attitudes. And we think that there are four reasons consistent with the evidence, uh, which are mental accounting, status quo effects, complexity, and uh, an absence of consumption uh, of the gains. I'll describe those more at the end. So we're, our goal here is mostly descriptive. We're mostly asking, how do people think about these tremendously important issues? Uh, there are a few reasons why we might care about these factual questions. The first is explanatory. There obviously are many reasons why we have the policy that we have. Uh, one part of the policymaking process uh, is to help show why we uh, have the policies that we see through understanding public attitudes. Second is instructive. Uh, understanding public attitudes can help provide policy design guidance pursuant to a particular goal. So here, if we want to know how to tax capital in politically feasible ways, part of that equation will be understanding what the public thinks. And third, of, and not our focus, uh, but also potentially important, is normative. Uh, given the need for voluntary compliance and other you know, democratic uh, normative reasons, uh, we might want to give normative weight to public attitudes. So let me turn now to the survey design and data collection, which I'll just describe briefly. Uh, so we ask a bunch of, we ask questions on demographics, we ask comprehension questions about tax and gains to get people's juices flowing. Uh, we then ask them, you know, how do you think we should tax uh, unsold stock gains? We then ask them, uh, why do you think that? We ask them free form and then we ask them in structured responses, you know, check some boxes for the ones, ideas you agree with. Uh, we then ask a large number of hypotheticals for uh, on other related policies. Uh, on, on unsold and sold assets to understand what is really driving people's thinking. So for example, we ask about what if uh, you don't sell, but you do borrow? And what about tax rates and things like that? So our data collection process involves having uh, 5,000 respondents. Uh, the survey was distributed by a commercial survey company that specializes in recruiting representative panels of high quality respondents paid about 350 participants. The survey took about 30 minutes. And we take a variety of steps to ensure uh, attention. Let me turn now to the, to the baseline results. Uh, and before I get to that, describe a little bit of the orienting material so that you know what our respondents are thinking uh, or what, have they, what they've been presented with when they actually answer, the, answer our questions. So we first explain a little bit about what it means to own stocks. We then present grocery co which we say is publicly traded and is, is not in a retirement account. Uh, we then follow this by asking them how, just factually, how each of two policies would affect a taxpayer who sees their stocks go up but does not sell, either if it's taxed this year or if it's taxed in the future. 
This is again, this is a policy that people haven't thought tons about, so we want to get them thinking a little bit. And then we present them with our the, the two policy alternatives. So we have a specific factual uh, case here. So we suppose that Kevin bought Grocery Co. at the end of last year. Uh, his stock goes up in value by $50,000. He does not sell any of his stock. And the government's choosing between two policies for taxing people like Kevin. And we ask, which do you prefer? And the first policy is that Kevin pays income tax this year on the increase in his stock, even though he does not sell it. We then further explain that if his stock later goes back down in value, those taxes are refunded. And because gains have already been taxed, will not have to be taxed on them again when he sells his stock. And then option two is uh, when Kevin, uh, Kevin pays income tax and increases in his stock only when he sells his stock in the future. So those are the two options. Uh, here are the results. And so this is the, the most important result of the paper. Uh, there's a huge, huge, huge disparity in support. People overwhelmingly prefer taxing only at sale uh, and not, not, not each year. There's a 50 percentage point difference. Only 25% prefer taxing unsold gains, whereas 75% uh, prefer taxing only at sale. So like I said, this is you know, the key result in the paper, and we're going to spend the whole rest of the time trying to kind of probe it, see if this holds up as we change the frame, change the persuasion, and then trying to understand ultimately what, what, what underlies uh, that this you know, really big uh, disparity in, in attitudes. Uh, so we have other, many other pieces of evidence that point to opposition uh, to taxing unsold stock gains. This persists across all groups, you know, including you know, say Democrats, it persists across other types of assets. Uh, we think pretty tellingly, when we give people a choice for raising a given amount of revenue by either raising everyone's taxes by the same amount, or alternatively, a new tax on unsold stock gains, most people, 54%, choose uh, taxing everyone's uh, or raising everyone's taxes, including 46% of those who don't even own taxable stock. So about half of people are preferring to raising their own taxes to uh, taxing unsold stock gains. They feel that strongly about it. Uh, we also uh, asked our federal income tax students. Uh, they were opposed at the beginning of the semester and they were opposed at the end of the semester, even after uh, several weeks of uh, education, uh, you know, bordering on propaganda about the problems of, of the realization rule. Uh, we furthermore, and this is where, where Steve has done lots of work, we find that most respondents uh, oppose fully taxing gains. Uh, this is one of the areas where Steve has done lots of work. Uh, we find that opponents, uh, that respondents uh, oppose fully taxing gains uh, through, through the property tax, which further supports that the idea that people don't like, the, like this idea of taxing uh, paper gains. There's a flip side to this though, like I mentioned at the outset, that people are, are at least our minds, surprisingly supportive of taxing on sale or transfer, uh, whether it's stock or homes or bequeathed stock uh, or, or uh, sold small businesses, all of these have uh, quite strong support versus, versus never taxing. The middle two of these are, are notable because tax law in the US generally excludes these now. And if we didn't, we could you know, raise $1.2 trillion over, over 10 years for bequeathed stock and sold homes. So I want to turn now to the, the treatment effects for our persuasion treatments. So we have uh, multiple treatments. Uh, one of those is the pro treatment. So here we explain uh, via a video of either uh, me or someone else uh, explaining that tox uh, taxing unsold stock gains is fair. We want to treat wealth like wages, uh, thereby by, by taxing gains every single year. We explicitly call out Mark Zuckerberg saying that we would close the loophole that lets rich people like Zuckerberg get away with paying taxes. We then have a con treatment uh, saying that taxing unsold gains is unfair, radical, complicated. It punishes middle class families and job creators. Uh, we point out that investors haven't gotten the benefit of their investment yet. They might have to sell to pay the tax, tax et cetera. We then have a third treatment that combines the two, that combines the pro and the con uh, uh, together. And this is designed to simulate as well as we can the kind of public discourse that might arise if uh, taxing stock gains before sale actually became close to becoming law, so that there were actually a broad public discussion about it beyond you know, tax wonks. 
So here are the results. So I begin with just uh, the control treatments, which is what I showed you at the outset. Uh, here's the pro and the, and the con. Uh, for the pro, there's actually a quite large increase. Support increases from 25% to 43%. So a 18% a, um, point increase, pretty big. Still a minority, but, but, uh, but a pretty big increase. For the anti, we, there's a seven percentage point decline, about a third decline, also fairly fairly large. But when you stick the two together, uh, there's only a five percentage point increase. So we have large sample sizes. These are statistically significant increases, but uh, we give people like, over two minutes of discussion about this and support increases from 25% to 30%. So uh, we think that if there were a public discourse, uh, good reason to think that support wouldn't increase that much. Uh, we have a separate treatment in which we say, okay, we're going to tax on sole gains, but we're only going to tax really rich people, those with above $10 million of wealth. And we furthermore change the hypothetical to be about having gains of $1 million instead of $50,000. Here again, uh, support increases uh, from only 25 to 34%, even for these you know, top fraction of, of one percenters. Uh, this is especially striking because you know, paralleling other surveys in the US, 70% of people think the rich pay too little in tax. Uh, as well, 68% think uh, we should raise corporate tax rates. So this modest increase in support for taxing before sale for the rich is rather surprising. Uh, one interpretation of this is that opponents of taxing before sale seem to think it's just a bad tax and they don't seem to care who pays. It's still a, it's still a bad tax. So we, I want to delve now into the reasons that uh, people seem to have for opposing uh, tax before sale. So we looked into you know, a dozen plus reasons. We think there are four uh, that best explain the results that we find. Uh, the first is mental accounting. So the idea here is that people perceive stock gains and losses in their own lives as if they are not, in a sense, real until they sell. So because of mental accounting, uh, even though one can get richer from wages and unsold stock gains by the same amount, one might react to this same increase in at least Hake Simon's income uh, in, in quite different ways. So one, one way in which we see this in the real world and people's real behavior is that investors seem to avoid selling stocks that go down in value. Uh, best evidence is that this is to avoid feeling internally like those losses are final, which you know, upsets people, even though they can actually save money on their taxes uh, by, by realizing those losses. Uh, so what mental accounting might do is that it might cause people's intuitions to be different about taxing sold and unsold stock gains because uh, you know, they're, not, they're not really real uh, if they're not sold in ways that are even reflected uh, in people's uh, own behavior. Uh, and in fact, our survey suggests that mental accounting is closely associated with attitudes toward taxing unsold stock gains. So what we, what we do is we ask people about uh, hypothetical tithing. So you earn 100,000 bucks, some of it's from wages, some of it's from unsold stock gains. Do you tithe out of those unsold stock gains? So 71% of people don't tithe out of those unsold stock gains. That's unsurprising. But there's this big, big, big disparity, big difference between uh, supporters of taxing only at sale and those who support taxing before sale. In particular, there's this 33 percentage point difference and there's this very strong correlation between being willing to tithe uh, out of your unsold stock gains uh, and, and supporting taxing before sale, which suggests to us that there are similar intuitions uh, underlying these and that that similar intuition is mental accounting. So that's, first, that's the first reason. Second is support for the status quo. So uh, when people incorrectly believe uh, that unsold stock gains are taxed today, uh, we find that support for tax and gains is 31 percentage points higher versus those who correctly believe that they are not taxed. So that suggests that the status quo might have an impact uh, on, on people's views. Uh, we also have a treatment on the status quo. So we, at the beginning of the survey, we try to nudge people away from the status quo. We say, hey, sometimes we actually do uh, change taxes uh, before sale. We mentioned depreciation. 
We mentioned the taxation of certain assets that uh, actually are taxed mark to market. And this, in fact, increases uh, support for taxing before sale uh, by five percentage points, a, a small increase. At the same time, uh, this appears unlikely, the status quo appears unlikely to drive a majority of the opposition to taxing unsold gains. Uh, we think this because among those who are unsure of current law, for whom the status quo uh, is likely to have the least effect, only again, 25% of those support taxing un, uh, unsold gains. Furthermore, when choosing between two explicitly new taxes to minimize status quo effects, people overwhelmingly, 68%, choose to impose a new tax on sold gains rather than a new tax uh, on unsold gains. Uh, so we, we think the status quo is playing some role, but that it's not the, not the predominant thing going on here. The third driver seems to be complexity. Uh, we asked people like, you know, what's driving your views on this? One of the strongest predictors of opposing taxing before sale is a concern about complexity. Furthermore, when we ask people free form, one of the most common words that appears is, is complicated. Uh, as well, in the anti-treatment, one of the most persuasive reasons is, is appears to be complexity. Uh, at the same time that this is driving people, we're not totally clear what's going on. Like, what's all that complex about this? Is it just aesthetics in the same way that like having a bunch of tax brackets is complex? Uh, so we think that this really uh, merit, merits more, more research. What exactly is going on here with complexity? The fourth and final reason that we uh, seems to be driving people uh, is that a significant fraction of people uh, seem to believe that when gains should be taxed depends on when they are consumed. So uh, if the person borrows against the unsold gains to fund consumption, we find that 36% prefer taxing the borrowed and consumed amount, even without a sale. So that's 11 percentage points higher than that 25% support in the baseline question. So some people seem to be moved by, by, by consumption, even without a sale. Uh, we also find that stock gains are sold, but also reinvested. Uh, there's much weaker support for taxing versus when gains that are sold and presumably consumed. And this is similar for other assets. So consumption and tuitions uh, also seem to be underlying uh, a decent part of the, the attitudes here. So uh, to wrap up here, uh, we show one, that the public seems to strongly resist the idea of taxation of gains before sale. Uh, in that second, uh, though there's some evidence that shifting the status quo could help shift attitudes some and that we can persuade people to some extent, uh, these attitudes seem to significantly relate to deep psychological tendencies like mental accounting, which are strong enough that even sophisticated investors lo lose money because of them. And this likely, likely helps explain the persistence of the realization rule in the US. And so far as I know, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, predominantly in every single country in the world. Uh, so are the policy implications here are that, you know, overall the results make alternatives to re, uh, repealing the realization rule more attractive, at least as a second best option. You know, discourse uh, can make a difference. Uh, and you know, if you think it's a good idea, you should keep on pressing for it, but if you can't have it, we need to look elsewhere. Uh, alternatives could be, um, we could tax corporations mark to market. Maybe a lot of the issue here is taxing individuals. Maybe people don't care as much about taxing Apple on its increase in, in market value, mark, uh, mark to market, that's a possibility. And then two through five here are all things that we show and others show there's actually wide support for taxing appreciated assets at, at death, taxing housing at sale, raising the corporate tax rate, uh, raising the capital gains tax rate. These, these are all feasible alternatives. And in fact, all things that Joe Biden has proposed. Uh, ultimately, though, we want to make a deeper point uh, that this psychology creates an effect, a significant barrier to taxing capital income that just does not apply uh, to labor income. Uh, and, and as uh, David Elkins pointed out in a uh, point in a very nice uh, Jotwell post, this thinking is just like really different from how uh, a, a a lot of you know tax wants to think about this, and it, that's it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, so you know this opens up a lot of questions as well. You know when and why does tax complexity matter? In what sense does the public want to tax consumption through the income tax? And questions like these are ones that we hope to learn, uh, that we and others hope to learn more about. 
uh, by studying public attitudes going forward. So thanks so much. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion.